Exo Clock. We'll start the intro music. Intro music for the show. That was the six o'clock beep. Don't hang up that phone. We found what you're looking for. Welcome to the Let's Talk Cabling Podcast with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Well, seeing how we're pulling Category 6A, the most powerful twisted pair in the world. You gotta ask yourself this one question Did I pull 295 or 300 feet? Well, do you feel lucky? Do you punk? What exactly does RCDD stand for? Registered Communications Distribution Designer. Just the expert you need to ensure your cable plant performs exactly as designed. The elite professional, knowledgeable, and experienced in leading edge ICT design principles. Now, send the new guy to the truck for a bucket of dial tone and the cable stretchers while you listen to an informative program on telecommunications. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That can only mean one thing. After Hours Live with Chuck Bowser, RCDD. Your favorite RCDD who's going to answer your information, communication, technology questions about design, installation, certification, estimation, project management, even career path questions. Every Thursday night. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Always start off every show with, what are you drinking? It is an after-hour show, so you can be drinking adult beverages. Tonight, Chuck is drinking ginger ale Zevia. Ginger ale Zevia. Yep. Put in the comments, what are you drinking? TikTok, here, V, what are you guys drinking tonight? Huh? Tequila? What? What? Wow. That's the way to go, man. I'm telling you. Uh, you know me, my Zevia sodas. I just absolutely love, 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 love my Zevia sodas. Let's see, what are some other people? Shotzi's in the house. Hello, Mr. Shotzi. Diet Dr. Pepper, as usual, as usual. Tony's in the house. Tony is drinking water. I need to drink more water. I'm usually good about drinking water, but I need to get better at it. And ever since I got my kidney stones, um, I typically now drink my water with a splash of lemon or a splash of lime because they say that helps reduce helps reduce kidney stones. And if you've ever had kidney stones, trust me, <laughs> you don't want to do that again. No, sir, rebop. Let me move the screen out of the way there. The top part of my computer was in the screen. So you know that I've been doing the podcast for about two years. A lot of people don't know that, you know, it costs money to run a podcast. It truly, truly does. So what I'm going to ask is, if you find value in this content, if you find value in any of the content I do, and you want to somehow help support the show, scan that QR code right there, okay? You can buy me a cup of coffee. You can schedule a 15-minute one-on-one Zoom call with me, after hours, of course. You can even uh, get a link to our YouTube page or our web page. I'm even looking for corporate sponsors. So if your company's values are educate, encourage, and enrich, look me up. Send me a thing. Let's talk. Okay. It does cost money to run this show. And I think my wife is kind of getting a little, I don't want to say upset. She's tired of footing the bill. Let's put it that way for this hobby of mine. A hobby of mine. I tell her it's not a hobby, baby. I am impacting the lives of people. Not a hobby. So the acronym for today, oh, you know what? I don't think I uploaded. So I just have to do it just old school way. The acronym for today is, let me look up my notes again real quick. L-S-Z-H. L-S-Z-H. What does that mean? Put your answer in the chat box on TikTok. Put your answer on YouTube. Put your answer in uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. Hey, you know another way that you can help support this show? Tell people about it. Tell people about it. If you know somebody's an installer, project manager, RCDD, Bixie technician, tell them about the show. Okay. So the acronym challenge, L S 
ZH. Going once. Going twice. It stands for low smoke zero halogen. Low smoke zero halogen. So it's low smoke free of halogen material during the construction of the actual cable in the jacket itself. Low smoke zero. I'm, I'm actually reading this is the definition per the thing. Low smoke zero halogen cable jacketing is comprised or composed of thermoplastic or thermoset compounds that emit limited smoke and no halogen when exposed to high sources of heat. You will find low smoke zero halogen a lot, especially in like uh, uh, Europe and stuff. There is some low smoke zero halogen installs here in the U.S. They're not quite as uh, as as uh, common here in the U.S. It's like it's it's almost the same thing as saying plenum cable. Okay. The next thing I always go to is the motivational minute. The motivational minute. Today's motivational minute is comes from a quote from none other. Than Stevie Wonder. Although this quote has been around in various forms throughout the lines. So the quote is, if you don't ask, you don't get it. If you don't ask, you don't get it. So if you're working for the man, ask for that training. If you need more money, ask for that raise. If you want to climb the career path, ask for that promotion. Because if you don't ask for it, the chances of you getting it are zero. Even if you don't think you'll get it. If you don't ask, the chances are zero. If you do ask, it might still be low. It might be 20%. But 20% is better than 0%, isn't it? So, you know, don't be afraid to ask. And that includes me. If you want me to do a show about something or whatever, don't be afraid to ask. I am open for content suggestions all the time. Hey, did you catch last week's show? I did the second part of of uh, how to troubleshoot network equipment and WAPs with Ed, the old tech guy. He's on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. Great guy. Great guy. A wealth of knowledge. So we did the second part of that episode. And we really, literally in that show, we talked about how do you explain it to the customer when it's an equipment problem, not a cable problem. Right, because it happens that way sometimes. Sometimes it's not us. Sometimes it's the the cable. We talk about how do you talk to the customer if it's a it's if it's an equipment problem. How do you talk to the customer if there's an IT person or they have a third a different contractor? We also talked about where you can find good information, good training on how to test or troubleshoot network equipment. It's a good show, absolutely good show, right? Ed, the old tech guy, just joined it. I was just talking about him. You are literally three seconds late, Ed. I was just promoting the show that we published last week. Next week's show, we talk to Jake Jones from Polywater about uh, why duct seal is not the best way to seal an outside plant conduit. It's done quite often in our industry, but it's not really the best way. So we talk about why is it not the best way. And we also talk about some options, some other options that you have that are far superior to that duck seal. That's next week's show. It'll publish Monday night, right about uh, 7 o'clock or so, give or take. Something new just happened. I was I was uh, talking to somebody via LinkedIn Messenger one night. My wife and I are sitting there watching TV because I work two jobs. I have a day job and the podcast is my night job. So I'm working. I do my podcast stuff tonight. I'm sitting here. My wife's watching TV. I'm working on doing stuff. Doing, people say I'm on social media all the time. Nuh-uh. My scheduler posts them all the time. I'm not on it all the time. Right? So this guy shot me a message and we just got to talking and he suggested that I should start a group on Meetup. Meetup. It's an app that you can download your phone. I'm already doing meetups. I've done meetups in Seattle and in, in, uh, um, a bunch of different cities, right? When especially when I travel, so I created an account on Meetup. Actually, I created two accounts on Meetup. One is called RCDD and Friends. RCDD and Friends. So if you're an RCDD or if you are a wannabe RCDD, you're you're currently studying or you you're thinking about join that group if you're on Meetup, because not only can you do schedule face to face meetups, you can also do virtual meetups. And I'm excited about that. I love that. I love that. So join that group because I'm probably going to do maybe maybe one virtual meetup a month, maybe, and then also face-to-face meetings. The other one, the other group that I created on Meetup is a group for Let's Talk Cabling. So it's all podcast related. So make sure you check them out when I do. I, matter of fact, I posted in there already. 
two meetups, one in each group, one for the RCD group, one in the, uh, the Let's Talk Cable group for a meetup at Bixie, at Bixie, right? So Bixie is coming up here in February. I want to say it's like February 4th to the 8th, 5th to the 8th, something like that. I'll be there on Tuesday and on Wednesday that week, right? So we'll do the meetups there. And also, if you see me walking around at Big C, you better stop and say hi. You better. Because in my little gift bag, I'm going to have Wire Monkey t-shirts. In my gift bag, I'm going to have podcast shirts. I'm going to have you hand stripper tools. I'm going to have uh, podcast stickers. Now, I have very, very limited quantities. So you better, Daryl says he's going to be there. You better catch me early before those shirts go out. Because I, I didn't order a bunch. Again, I need a sponsor. I need a sponsor to help do this kind of stuff. All right. So I'll be there Tuesday and Wednesday. I'm definitely going. I love going to the the banquets, the, the, Wednesday, the banquet on Wednesday night. I love going to that thing. Okay. Last week's Q&A. I mean, last week's after hours live stream, we did a Q&A. Okay. A Q&A. Ed, send me a message with your shirt size. I will send you a wire monkey shirt, buddy. Um, so last week we didn't do a regular Q and A section. We actually did well. We did a quality assurance video, a, a live cast. So we brought up pictures and we talked about what was good, what wasn't good, and I got such a huge flux on that. Everybody was was uh, uh, saying, "Hey, would they love that?" I'm gonna start doing that once a month. Fiber flippers in the house. Fiber flipper. Um, I'm going to start doing the QA ones once a month, right? So I, I'll probably do the last week. So if you want me to QA a project that you did, email it to me, and I'll talk about what's good about that job and what's bad about that job. But I'm going to do it in a in an instructional kind of way. I'm not going to beat your head up over it. I'm not going to say, this guy doesn't know what they're doing. No, no. I've been a QA inspector for all my life. Well, not all my life, but a good portion of my life. I know how to do QAs. And still make it, you know, whatever. So, so uh, let's get into the questions, okay? The first question comes to me from Terry on LinkedIn, and I I kind of shortened his question down a little bit. So Terry asked me, "I'm ordering some tools for my warehouse guy to use to correctly strip Cat Six cable and the individual pairs for the connections on the terminals on a modular service jack." We are doing a ton of these, so I'm looking for something that will allow us to do these exact and efficient. It's going to be on a bench, not in the field, so probably would need to be two different tools. What two tools could I uh, set specific cutting depths for and not damage anything? He's asking me, what was my recommendations? So it's the Category 6 cable, and the jack part number that he listed, I didn't put it in the questionnaire, I shortened it down. The jack part that he shortened, he listed is the, is the type of modular jack that has screw terminals on the back of it because he's doing pots cable. My, so my people on TikTok can see as well. So the type of jack he's using are these. It's for a service mount box. He's going to put inside of, a, I think, like a security system or maybe a fire alarm system where they're making that connection to the pot service, right? So for those who may not know, to actually terminate this, you got to take your screwdriver, unscrew this, and then you got to strip off the dielectric off the conductor, wrap around the conductor, tighten it up, and then cut off the excess, okay? I'm old school. I told him the best tool for stripping cable jacket, at least as far as I'm concerned, is the fluke wire stripper. I love this thing. You can set the depth, all that stuff. There's many others out there. Many others out there. Um, I already talked about the U-hand. Uh, the jury's still out with the, the U-hand. I want to use this more before I start saying if I really like it or not. That'll strip the jacket off it. And then if you want to strip that dielectric off the conductors for that screw down type of a jack, you can use these little the notches on the back of your snips, okay? The notches on the back of your snips, right? If you have a preferred method for stripping, you don't you don't like you let's say you don't like using the fluke. Tell me in the comments what tool do you like to use to strip the cable jacket? What kind of tool do you like to use to strip the the dielectric off of the jacket? Put it in the comments, okay? Because I'm sure he's watching today. Question number two. This question comes from Michael Makupa. Makupa. There we go. Him and I talk quite a bit on LinkedIn. And, and when he said, I told him I wanted to use this question. Um, 
I asked him how to pronounce his last name. He's uh he lives in Canada. Um, really good guy. He's a he's a certified fiber optic technician and NCS as well. So he shot me a question and he says, Chuck, I've seen more and more guys that are using the new Milwaukee Angler fish tape to actually pull the cables through conduit. I know it's rated to 250 pounds, right? 250 pounds. How is that safe for four pair cable if it's rated, if four pair cable were not supposed to exceed 25 pounds of maximum pulling tension? Now, I meant to grab a graphic of this last night and, and make a graphic for the thing, but I just I ran out of time. For those who don't know what the mat, uh, what the uh, Milwaukee angle fish tape is, it's a fish tape that's battery powered, battery powered. So you don't have to sit there and, 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 you know, and pull it out. You don't have to sit there and wind up. It does all that for you. Right. I, I, I want to say it's, it's 300 bucks, three or 400 bucks. Right. It's a, uh, now I looked on their website. Right. And they touted it as the first battery powered fish tape solution. And it's, and, and it's kind of universal. So there's different drums that you can buy for this fish tape. There's one that's the 200 foot metal fish tape. And then they have a 100 foot non-conductive fishing rod. Okay, it depends on which drum that you put to it. So you can buy it and have multiple drums, right? And just pop it in, right? Now, the thing is, it has got it does have a variable speed motor. Right, and it's also powered by the the M18 br uh, battery that Milwaukee has for all their power tools, and it has a brushless motor system. Now they claim that it's going to help keep the job sites cleaner and help reduce fatigue on installers. I can certainly understand the fatigue. If you've ever tried to roll up a 50 foot quarter inch fish tape, dude, your shoulders hurt afterwards. They absolutely hurt afterwards, right? So the problem is. I've never used one of these. They're, they're brand new. And I don't have $400 to drop on a tool that I'll never use. My wife would kill me, kill me, if I spent that kind of money on something that wasn't a direct thing. They, they, oh, by the way, Milwaukee claims that you can fish with that battery-powered fish tape. You can fish up to 200 feet through 360 degrees of transition. 360 degrees of transition. Okay, So that's, you know, that's, what, 490s? No. Yeah, 490s. Now, like I guess that I've never had one of these, and I'm not going to go out and buy one. If Milwaukee's watching this and they want to send me one to do a product demo, I would love to do that. I would absolutely love to do that. But again, I don't have $400. So I went to Milwaukee, and I, I, I there's a person I'm connected to on LinkedIn in Milwaukee. I shot him a message, and I also went on the website, and I shot them a message to the customer service. They had not yet responded back as the as right before I went on this show today. So what does that leave me to do? YouTube, right? YouTube. So I got on YouTube and I typed in Milwaukee Angler Fish Tape and I found a couple of videos, right? I think the best one that I came across that the, that's the closest application, Fiber Flipper, thank you for answering that, buddy. Um, the best one I could come up with was a, was a channel called Addicted to Tools. Addicted to Tools. Now, the guy who runs that channel, I think he's an Aussie. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but he does have a slight bit of an accent. So he he did a he did a video about that tool, and he fished a 70 foot conduit, 70 foot conduit with three nineties. So he sat there on one end, he clicked, he pulled on the trigger, it, it put the fish tape through, went through the three nineties, went to 70 feet. He came out the other end, he attached a single four pair cable to that, taped it up, and then he used the fish tape and in reverse, and it pulled it all the way through. Okay. Now, he time-lapsed it, so I don't know how long it took him, but it seemed pretty easy. It seemed pretty easy. Now, here's the thing. Number one, it was only 70 feet. Number two, it was a single category, single four-pair cable. I don't even know if it was category rated because he didn't say that, right? And he did, But he did go through 390s. Technically, if you read the, uh, the best practice manuals, they're going to tell you two 90-degree bends. You are allowed to have a third if, the, if that third one's within 12 inches of the feet end, but most of them, they're going to limit it to two 90 degree bends between pulling points, right? So he did do it and it looked pretty easily. So then I went and checked the actual rating. So, so on that website, people can leave five star ratings. I love this tool. One star rating. This tool sucks. So I went through all the ratings, right? And it seemed to be mixed. 
There are some people who absolutely love that battery powered fish tape. Absolutely loved it. But the majority of those comments were posted by people who just bought it. There were a couple other ones that were people who I guess have been using for a while. There seemed to be quite a few posts about the, the design of the drums and how the drums keep failing. So 300 bucks, I, yeah, and Milwaukee's got a name for good tools. I wouldn't expect that. So keep that in mind if you decide to go down this. So here's my recommendations. If you want to go spend the $300 to have one more tool, we all know there's people like that, right, Ed? There's people like that out there who just, they got to have every single tool that's made, right? But, uh, you know, I forgot to tell you. That fish tape, that, that battery power fish tape weighs eight pounds. Eight pounds. Now that may not sound like a lot, but when you're sitting and you're supporting, you're on a, you're on top of a scissor lift and you're supporting that thing while it's doing this business, trust me, that eight pounds after a while is going to hurt. It's going to hurt. So here's what I would do. If you want to buy that tool, absolutely go have at it. I would buy the tool if I if I were to buy it until until Milwaukee answers back from me. I would only use it to run the fish tape through the conduit. Once it comes out the other side, I would not attach a cable. I would attach a pull string and pull the pull string back through. Okay. Now you can manually control how much, how much uh, pressure you're putting on that cable. By the way, I'll put links for the descriptions and uh, links for the, the YouTube video and also the, the uh, Milwaukee site as well um, in the description down below. Okay. The next question, this question comes from Jasmine. Jasmine is uh, one of my mentees from last year. She got her RCDD late in the year and uh, really smart individual. So now that she's got her RCDD, she's worried about getting her CECs. So she has shot me a message that what's the best way to get CECs, especially at low or no cost. So first, for those who may not have a certification through Bixie, you may not know what a CEC is. It's, Dan, it's an acronym. Imagine that. Another acronym in our industry. It stands for Continuing Education Credits. Okay. CECs. So anybody who gets a Bixie certification, you have to accrue a certain amount of continuing education credits, which are based on hours of, of instruction. Now, the instruction could be uh, tactile instruction where you're doing stuff, or it could be uh, PowerPoint, you know, lecture type. doesn't matter. Um, this is based on the hours. But you have to do that. And the reason you're doing that is the reason Bixie wants you to take CEC classes is they want you to stay current. Now, how many CECs do you need? The CECs depends on what certification you have. You know that I have an RCDD. I have to get 45 CECs every registration period. If you've got the DCDC or the registration registered telecommunications project manager or the certified trainer, you have to have 36 CECs. The OSP certification, 24 CECs, okay? Whoa, so Daryl says, I've had my RCD for 21 years, haven't paid for a CEC in the last 15 years. Lots of online classes. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go through them. I'm going to go through them. If, you have, if I miss any, let me know, Daryl. The, R, the uh, RITP is 22. If you have the ESS, the NTS, or the WD and technician certifications, those are 18 CECs. If you got the installer two, installer two copper, installer two fiber, those are 15 CECs, continuing education credits. So what actually is it? So I've 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 got a lot of classes certified for CECs over the years. So it's a class. The class doesn't have to be made by Bixie, although Bixie does have classes for CECs. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Anybody who comes up with a class, they can get they can they can come up with it and they're gonna send the syllabus, a time map. And all the other content, like a sample, the certificate, and any other materials we're going to be using to Bixie. Bixie will evaluate that, and then they're going to assign a number of CECs based on the actual seat time. Okay, they don't they don't count breaks, they don't count lunch, they don't count exams. It's actual seat time. Okay, and just because you get a class that says Bixie CECs. That does not mean that that Bixie that, that Bixie endorses that course. It just means they've evaluated the content, and they agree with the time map, and they said it should take this long. That doesn't mean they endorse it. They just mean that they assign continuing education credits for it. Now, I'll put a link in the description below about about the CEC program, because uh, I got all those hours from the 
the CEC program document that they produced, dot four dot I'll put that link in the description after I publish this as well. Now let's talk about some of those options. Now, if you've listened to the show for more than once, you've heard me say this before. Cable installation and maintenance magazine. Subscribe to it. They also do webcasts every month. I think I think they do two a month, right? They they do them during business hours. They record them and then they post them on their website. And then after I think two months, they take them off. So right now, if you go to uh, Cable Installation Maintenance Magazine's website, go to their webcast page, you'll find fifteen or so one-hour webinars right there. You can watch and get CECs for it right now, free. Okay. Periodically, they're going to do multiple day events, like about. Three months ago, I want to say they did a two day data center thing. That if you watched it and logged in or each one of those sections, you got your CECs. Manufacturers also create courses and get them recognized for CECs. You know, my good bread, my, my, good, my good brother Todd from um, Brother Solutions, they have a two hour CEC course on the labeling standards. Okay, there's a free one. Leviton. They have over 10 of them. You just got to go to the Easy Learn platform and sign in for it. Omnitron has three that I could find. Eaton Trip has them as well. And there's many other manufacturers. Another avenue you can look at is Bright Talk. Bright Talk. They have classes, not just on communication. They have classes on, on I bet you they have classes on, on the, Ed, what's it, Chat GPT? What's that new thing? I, I, bet, I bet you they've got classes on that already. That they, it's, it's everything. From you name it, they do it. Some of the classes you do have to pay for, but there are a lot of free ones as well. So now Bixie also has free and low cost webinars as well. Uh, you can do the webinars, you can do the virtual ICT forms, right? Um, and some of them, some of them are free, and some of them charge. I just paid for one. Um, I think it was right before Christmas, right before I did my vacation, and it was like twenty five bucks. Now, I don't typically pay for them, but there was one. I looked at the I looked at the the, the presenters there, and there's one person there presenting something I absolutely wanted to catch, right? Another avenue that many people don't think about: safety classes, safety classes, right? And usually, if you're working for a company, you don't own your own business. If you're working for a company, usually they pay for that class. So, like for example, the OSHA 10 class, you can get CECs for attending that class. Just send the uh, send your certificate. You might have to send a uh, an outline of what you learned, and send it to them. Either I usually do my stuff online with them. I've never had a class rejected by Bixi that was a safety course related for submitting for my CECs. Okay, I'll put all those links for all those descriptions, Eaton's and Omnitron and and Leviton's. I'll put that in the description down below in the YouTube version of this. Okay. The next question, this comes from an Instagram user, Instagram user. And he said, when should I select armored fiber over premise fiber? Premise distribution fiber, for those who don't know, that's the cable that you typically go and install inside of the building, right? Uh, you have the, the strands of fiber, usually surrounded by, sometimes you might have a fiberglass rod in there, sometimes you won't. You have the... Uh, Aramid yarn, also known as Kevlar, and then a jacket around that. And they're available in your plenum rated and your rider, riser ratings as well. Now, if you're installing premise distribution cable inside of an office building, they do recommend that you put it inside of interduct. Inside of interduct. Okay? Recommended, not required. Key there. Recommended, not required. Now, why do they want us putting the cable inside of interduct? Well, number one, uh, it provides some protection, minimal protection. You, you, it, if you don't mind me, that is, if you've ever stepped on an interduct, you know it doesn't provide a lot of protection, right? The real reasons for that interduct is, number one, it's a visual indicator to the other trades. Hey, look, if you break our fiber, we're going to charge you a million dollars to come fix this thing, right? Million dollars. It's also an additional pathway for future fibers, so that's also one there as well. Now, even though it's in the standards and a lot of people do it, a lot of people assume that it's that it's a requirement by the standards, but it's not. It's what we call a de facto standards. Okay, provides minimum minimum protection. Now, then you got armored fiber. 
armored fiber per foot is more expensive than premise distribution fiber because you got the same components of that armored fiber. Plus, you also have a I got a piece of armored jacketing here for demonstration purposes. You see, it's got a metal locking wrap around. I think I've talked about this before, right? All right. So you got that metal interlock, metal interlocking wrap that surrounds it, gives it protection. There's even a couple versions of armored fiber that use non-metallic armored fiber. I don't know how much I trust those. I've never never had the opportunity to install them, uh, so I don't know how much crush strength they have. So it does prevent, protect you from crush. And they're they're available in plenum rating and riser rating. Um, and if you use the armored fiber, you, you don't have to worry about the inner duct because they're not going to step on it and break it. But if you don't install the inner duct, you're giving up that additional pathway later on. Later on. If you use armored fiber over traditional premise distribution fiber with inner duct, you will save money on the job because you don't have to buy the inner duct. You don't have to buy the, uh, uh, the, the labor to put it in. How much do you save? It depends on your labor rates. Right, the labor rates in New York are going to be a little bit more than the labor rates in Tampa, Florida. Right, and same thing with the materials. Now, with all this being said, I would I would use armored fiber. Number one, when the customer specifies it, if the customer specifies armored fiber, I'm more than happy to install it. Okay, the only other times I'm going to select armored fiber is when there's environmental conditions that absolutely require, it, like an industrial plant or high traffic area, where I'm really worried about something damaging that fiber. Okay, because with arm with armored fiber, especially the metallic interlocking armored fiber, you got to bond it to the ground, and that's an additional thing that you got to go over. Next question. This comes from Henry, Henry from Instagram. He wants to know how can I price removing abandoned cable, <laughs> a dartboard. Put a bunch of numbers on the dartboard and throw a dart at it, and whichever number it hits, that's the number you use. Well, surely I jest, but <laughs> right. And here's the thing: why is it so hard to estimate? removing a banded cable because typically you're removing somebody else's cable you don't know what the quantity you're removing you don't know what installation techniques they use to install that i saw a job one time where the previous installer literally tie wrap the main bundle of cables every five feet and if you're removing a band of cable you got to go through and cut those all off so the best way to price that is time and material Time and material. Time and material just means you keep track of the hours that you used and any materials, and you bill the customer for that. Customers hate TM jobs. You can do TM not to exceed, right? Where you charge them time and material, but you gave them some imaginary number and you promise that you won't bill them if you get that number. You're taking some risk there. Some people do free just for the scrap value of the copper. Big no no. Big no no. Again, Copper is a commodity. Prices fluctuate. You can do unit pricing. I had a guy tell me in a class one time that they charge $100 a cable to remove abandoned cable. $100 a cable. Well, if I'm a customer, how do I know that you didn't take one cable and then cut it into two? And now you're charging me $200. So, But I've never seen it done. I've never done it that way. So I can't offer any insight on that particular way. If the customer just absolutely wants to... Do they want you to nail you down to a number, right? Number one, you better do a pretty thorough walkthrough. A pretty thorough walkthrough. Look at all the ceilings everywhere. And then you get you come up with your hours and your materials. You put it together. And then in your terms and conditions, you're going to put verbiage in there and say, look, my price is based on finding X amount of feet or X amount of weight of copper cable. If we find that there's more cable that we reserve the right to bill for additional time and material. So it's kind of like a TM job, but it's not a TM job. But you got to put that verbiage in your assumptions. If you don't, if you don't, you're gonna get you're gonna get stuck holding the short end of that stick. Okay, last question, question number six. This comes from a TikTok user again, and I, I picked this one specifically because it's still talking about abandoned cable, right? And uh, so I did a, somebody did a post. Oh, I did a post about abandoned cable. Why need to be removed and all that fun stuff. And then somebody put a label, uh, put a comment on there. Just label it for future use. Just label it for future use. I, I certainly hope that was a joke, but it's kind of hard to tell in comments sometimes, right? With comments, you lose the whole, you know, uh, nuance of language. So it might've been a joke, might not have been. So what does he really mean by for future use? In the code book, it says that all accessible portions of abandoned cable shall be removed. That means you got to remove it. 
unless now what so we get into the def the legal definition of abandoned it means a cable that's terminated on both ends or plugs into a piece of equipment or one end is labeled for future use okay so if you, if you have cable bundle cables in the ceiling you can put a label on that says for future use technically it meets that that the code and you don't have to remove that but you really should be removing all the abandoned cable because it's a fuel load for a fire. I've talked about this many, many times, and I'll talk to it until I'm blue in the face. But only label cables for future use that are cables that are literally for future use. Don't use this to bypass the code because if you use it to bypass the code, they could still catch you on that. And they could, if something happens, somebody dies because there's too much heat or too much smoke, they can come after you for that because you broke the code book. But if I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I'm doing a modular furniture project. I'm running some cables, and I know that uh, they're I know they're missing a few drops. So I run a couple extra drops, but since they haven't identified them yet, I'll leave them cooled up in the ceiling. I could put a label on those for a future use. That that's a perfect application. But if I'm doing a job in a building, and let's say they've got uh, some Type One cable, some dual RG59 coax, stuff that hasn't been used in decades, and I just don't want to remove that cable because I'm lazy. And I slap a label for future use. Guess what? The dual RG59 is not going to be used. The type one is not going to be used. I'm just putting the label on there to get around to circumnavigate the, the code. You know, there's, there's sometimes there's this, this thing when you do things that are legally obligated, and sometimes you do things when they're morally obligated. Are you doing the right thing morally? No, you're not. All right, that does it for tonight's show. I am already at six minutes past. I apologize, everybody. I wasn't really watching the chat box. So uh, let's just look at a couple of chats here. So Luke says, uh, why not just use the snips for both procedures? That's actually a great question. You can use snips for stripping the jacket off as well as stripping the conductor. But if you're stripping off with the snips, you got to be careful not to squeeze too hard to dig into the jacket to scar that conductor. So you can absolutely do that. So uh, Shanta is in the house. Shanta came to our Orlando meetup. Uh, good to see you again, my friend. Uh, Jasmine made it to the thing. She's the one that you wanted questions today. Pixie offered a three credit class last night, but she didn't get on. Ah, gotcha. Chris Darda says STI also has a bunch as well. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. All righty. So that does it for tonight's show. Until next time, buddy, everybody. Remember, knowledge is power. Show's over. Let's go eat some pizza.